In 1997, the NHK, also called the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, banned the term of otaku from being utilized on national television. But let us think for a second. Anime and manga. These two words are something that cannot be detached when we discuss about the modern Japanese culture, as many younger generation of people who are interested in Japan and its culture may have gotten their initial interest toward Japan through watching various forms of Japanese animations or reading Japanese manga. And that is perfectly normal, as a significant number of Japan-made anime is widely consumed and is more than popular around the entire globe. And how do we call the people who have a passionate interest towards anime and manga? Otakus. But with that said, being an open otaku in Japan may not be all fun and games. To elaborate, some concerns in which I have frequently observed from certain individuals was whether being a conspicuous otaku and its entailed stereotypes could pose a negative influence on the individual's chances of success in various fields of their lives, from how the reputation of being one could hinder them from being successful in their careers, to having normal social relationships with others, to even being able to find romantic success with the person of the opposite sex. And perhaps such concerns can be somewhat justified to a degree as otakus were frowned upon by the general population and received more than a share of negative reputation and were more than often a source of wide public shaming in the country of Japan where the entire concept has originated from. So in today's video, we will be discussing why otakus have been such a relentless target of public shaming in Japan throughout the decades, and the direction in which this historical trend is heading towards as of current in Japan. Many may believe that this unfavorable stereotype which exists for otakus stems from the general image of a pale man with thick glasses on, with none or bare minimum level of social skills. And such image is not all merely a myth, as people in parallel to these descriptions certainly do exist in real life as well. So while it would be a lie to say that such types of otakus do not exist in real life, as you will see quite a decent number of them if you visit Akihabara, we must also take into consideration that media outlets often feature and exaggerate the number of otakus of such style quite drastically in order to convey a more extreme, sensational image and ridicule their existence. And with such stereotype being firmly in place in the mindset of a number of Japanese people regarding otakus, it is rather unsurprising that a TV series by the name of Train Man or Densha Otoko in Japanese found immense popularity on Japanese television. The plot of the TV series was that of an unsociable otaku who manages to quote unquote successfully escape from his otaku status and thus as a consequence finds himself able to get in a romantic relationship as well as ultimately reach the goal of marriage with a beautiful woman whom he has first encountered at the train. One of the prominent reasons why the train man found such success during his airtime in Japan was due to the sheer sensational, almost Cinderella-like plotline of an otaku actually successfully reaching marriage with a normal, beautiful woman from all society standards, and not with a doll, not with a pillow, and not with a hologram. So the most, if not all of negative stereotypes headed towards the way of otakus in Japan stem from such preconceptions of social awkwardness as well as general lack of physical appeal? The answer is no, as the negative perception towards otakus in Japan has a far deeper history than what many people may be currently aware of. While the word otaku was first technically utilized from as early as in 1983, the specific event in which led this term to be wide known to the general public was unfortunately something extremely heinous in nature. A Japanese serial killer who has committed truly heinous crimes in which I cannot mention in this video, in less than the span of two years in the late 1980s, received the wide Japanese media attention which began to call him as the otaku murderer due to the large amounts of anime and manga which was found in his room subsequent to the arrest. Some do claim that the extent in the killer's collection of anime and manga were exaggerated, as the main constituents of his collection were pornography and horror films of different kinds. Nevertheless, as this was the first instance in which the term otaku had placed itself in the mindset of many Japanese people, vastly negative preconceptions 
such as potential criminals or individuals with mental handicaps who are firmly ingrained in the popular Japanese psyche regarding otakus, making the period an extremely dark time to be considered as one in Japanese society. However, while some degree of negativity still does indeed exist towards otakus and its subculture, it is not as base as the one which existed in the late 20th century. In fact, many would argue that the otakus have become one of Japan's elements of national pride in the international sphere as the nation heavily leads in the global production of anime and attracts millions of people worldwide to become enamored of the nation and its culture. So at which specific point did the atmosphere turn around so drastically for the otakus and have their reputation morph from the nation's taboo term and the go-to target for intense public shaming for whatever societal problem that emerged in Japan into a source of national pride for many only in the span of a decade. The catalyst which ignited such a dramatic transition in the otaku stereotype to the positive direction ironically came from abroad rather than from domestic influences. In 2002, Douglas McGray wrote the now famous Japan's Gross National Cool as a foreign policy article and the conception of the otaku culture has been changing ever since. In the article, he discussed how Japan has been establishing itself as a cultural superpower and that through cultural devices such as popular music, anime, and cuisine, Japan now seems to have more international power and influence than it did back in the 1980s. Maybe it was the term superpower that really boosted the confidence of the Japanese people who have onto that point in the 2000s have been unfortunately suffering from what economists coined as the lost decade. Mostly characterized by the nation's economic collapse and disappearance in national confidence. The Japanese media began to incessantly discuss and revel in its newly coined status as an emerging soft power that injected international influence through its arts and culture and the Japanese government itself began to shift its cultural policy towards the one of cool Japan not long after the release of the article. Again, one can only spot the irony in that the group and subculture in which the nation was originally so embarrassed about and made it to be a constant target for deliberate public shaming for the past decade has now became a decisive factor in reigniting the nation from its ears and ears of economic stagnation. This goes to show that the average otaku who has a passionate interest towards anime and manga should not be embarrassed in regards to their identity as the very industry in which they are an integral part of has been playing the role of a national powerhouse for commercial export as well as dramatically boosting the nation's tourist industry. One only has to look at the sheer number of pre-COVID foreign visitors to Japan who specifically visited the country in order to attend anime-related events such as the Comicat convention. While a total number of mere 700 people visited the Comicat convention back in 1975, a staggering 730,000 people visited the convention in 2019. And with Japan finally looking to slowly reopen its borders again to tourists, the foreign visitors who are looking to visit Japan primarily as a consequence of their love towards the otaku culture will once again, without a doubt, return in a strong fashion. So while it would be inaccurate to state that the culture of otaku shaming has been completely eradicated, it would also be false to claim that the degree of negative social stigma attached to being an otaku as of current is the same as it was in the past. So with the increasing accepting attitude towards otakus in current Japanese society, an adult male can openly identify himself as an otaku and not be met with intense public shaming as it was in the case in the past as long as they are what you call in Japanese, yaju, as in an individual who is first and foremost committed to real life responsibilities as a mature, socially responsible adult before his activities as an otaku in the virtual, fictitious realm. Another interesting phenomenon that I'd briefly like to mention before ending this video is how some mavericks in Japanese society are in fact turning their otaku status as a fashionable plus which in fact aids in the personal appeal and image. One such person is Roland, who's a Japanese host as well as a famous TV personality. One can consider him as in parallel to being like the Gordon Ramsay of the Japanese host industry 
as along with being a record sales host with the nickname The King of Hosts. He currently has more than a million subscribers on his YouTube channel and possesses a huge following across Japan. And while being such a socially prominent figure, with many young people across Japan idolizing him as a symbol of success, he makes it no secret of his love for anime and manga and voluntarily describes himself as an otaku. So with the linguistic connotation associated with the word otaku slowly but surely changing, especially with the younger generation of Japanese people, the long-standing culture of shaming towards otakus may finally be coming towards its end.